Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Time is on your side. Username harvesting via timing attacks. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Eric Conrad, Certified SANS Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for Eric, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Eric. Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to my talk. And uh, feel free to grab my email address there. Eric at ericconrad.com is one of many that will uh, reach me. There's my website. And speaking of my website, let me uh, hold it on my screen here. So, uh, yeah. I have a copy of this talk on my website, which is ericconrad.com. So if you want to go ahead and download a copy of the talk, you can shoot to ericconrad.com. And a uh, copy of the talk, all links, et cetera, are right there. So uh, if you want to get started with this stuff, especially the, well, all this stuff, including the, uh, the attack announced last month by Eddie Harari, the OpenSSH OpenSSHD attack is um, amazing, super practical. I'm surprised it hasn't made a bigger splash than it has because it is crazy practical and works against literally everything I've tried. And um, I'm hoping this talk will do a small part to uh, change that and get the word out about how practical this talk is. So uh, go there, including some links. Some links I didn't have a chance to fit in as we we're discussing this talk uh, ahead of time with some SANS folks. John Strand mentioned a few articles his folks have written at Black Hills InfoSec on password spraying, timing attacks, very, very timely topic that's coming up a lot now. We keep finding new timing attacks, and again, they often tend to be crazy practical. And uh, just to give a shout out to uh, John's site, and also, uh, not really to this talk, but just awesome, my favorite blog post of this month anyway so far, I know it's early, How to Build Your Own Pen Testing uh, Dropbox by Bo Bullock. Um, most people would buy a Raspberry Pi for that. He gave a big shout out to the hard kernel of Droid. And, um, just, uh, uh, just shout out to, to Bo's uh, post because I, I like that even though it's not directly related. All right, let's get on with it. It's of course all filed out of pen testing. So um, very timely talk and you know what we find now is as we find harder targets which you know still happen as a pen tester or we have a pretty limited external foothold and the client has done a good job of hardening that perimeter. You know, perimeter hardening is still straightforward stuff. People make mistakes, certainly. And one of the more common mistakes they still make is uh, single-factor authentication on Internet-exposed systems. And when that happens, this gives us an opportunity to strike. So, the, you know, the, the idea here is the clients avoided many of the common mistakes. They have a good uh, secure firewall. They have a hardened perimeter. They have DMZs, all that kind of stuff. And that's handling most attacks. In fact, that's handling most pen tests. One of my favorite types of pen testing is what we call, you know, full knowledge crystal box, where I have access to internal documentation, including last year's pen test uh, report, and or last quarter's whatever, and so I get to see the handiwork of basically hundreds of pen testers because I always ask for that report, and I get to see what my competition, the other pen testers, are doing, and one of the things they consistently miss is this vector, guessing usernames. It's kind of bread and butter. It's kind of old school, but there's some new. Um, tweaks now to the new generation of encryption that's coming now, which is basically hard encryption, you know, costly encryption, is now become uh, very standard, or I guess it's a leading edge at the beginning now on many of these uh, authentication forms. We'll discuss why computationally expensive encryption actually, while it's a best practice, offers us an opportunity. And if we face a harder target, the thing's fully patched, the perimeter's hardened, what do we do? Well, social engineering, but also just username harvesting. I know it's old school, but it, it, it's bread and butter of what we need to do as a penetration tester is figure out valid usernames. Once we have a valid username, we're halfway to a, a valid um, a potential username uh, password guessing attack. So we start with the username, and then we need the password. You could just spray both you know, wildly fuzz usernames and passwords. That's what the bots tend to do online. Not very efficient at all, of course, and we have limited time. And some of these attacks do take seconds per attempt. So seconds per attempt doesn't sound like much, but if we're guessing millions of times, suddenly those seconds per attempt count. So we need to be more efficient. And certainly a hallmark of a strong pen tester is um, efficiency. 
So we want to harvest usernames from authentication pages, and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's harder. The easy way is when there's a noticeable error between these two use cases. Uh, good username, bad password, bad username, bad password, right? And so that's the classic opportunity, and most of my clients anyways that are more clued in have figured that part out, to follow best practice, and it's considered best practice certainly to give the same exact error for good username, bad password, bad username, bad password. You don't want the attacker to infer a good username. Now, some of my clients overtly choose to give a different error as an attempt to lower the total cost of ownership of pe people picking up the phone. Why? Uh, yes, yes, in 2016, people forget their username. It happens. So they're typing in the wrong username and the wrong password. Of course, they're getting nowhere. Or maybe the wrong username with the right password for their actual username. And inevitably, they pick up the phone and call the help desk, whatever. This raises the total cost of ownership. My clients, some of them want to avoid that phone call because it's very expensive. It ties up a human. So sometimes they'll tell the user, hey, no such, um, no such account. And then it'll hopefully clue in the less clueful user who doesn't know their own username, which is you know, on the uh, bell curve of ability of what we do. That's on the left, let's say. And maybe they won't pick up the phone. Maybe they will. Or sometimes the, the login form is fine as far as those two errors being the same. But the I, I forgot my password form is it does tell you. So the login form is done properly, same error, good username, bad password, bad username, bad password. But you go to hit the I forgot my password, uh, you type your username, it says no such username. So there you go. So we'll, we'll, we'll search for these and we'll find them. And then what if you know none of that works? Um, or I guess backing up a little bit, how do we figure out a potential username if we're going blind? Certainly, the most common format is E. Conrad for Eric Conrad. That's valid on all my systems. The attack I'm going to show you live, live demo of the OpenSSH um, timing flaw is against a live system that is completely as it was for months now. I, I didn't like pre-configure it or, or pre-harden it or pre-unharden it. It's actually a system I have on the internet in the wild uh, running Ubuntu 16.04 vulnerable to this attack. And I like, and I've left it that way at least temporarily. <laughs> I'll be changing it a bit, of course. I just told you my username's E. Conrad, so I guess I've already shown my hand here. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll patch it later, but I'm glad that an actual live system in the wild, I can do this demo over a live network, and I can say, here, this is the real system that I'm about to fix, but haven't yet. Uh, meaning this is like probably every system out there, uh, any reason Linux is vulnerable to this. So if we're looking for the system telling us good username versus bad, uh, sometimes it'll tell us, hey, no such username. Sometimes there'll be a subtle difference in the response. You know, there'll be a code zero for uh, bad username, code one, uh, burp, compare, can show these things. We'll demo burp in a little bit. Uh, we can do a compare versus a known bad form, a known bad user of like ASDF, username ASDF, password ASDF. That's now our you know baseline, and then we'll compare from there and Burp can automate that process, uh, subtle differences in size, error codes, and uh, a common one we see a lot actually is, which I'll demo shortly, is a bad username when you reload the form or hit enter, the form returns blank, but a good username with a bad password, the form returns with the password filled in, and that's one of the use cases we'll look at, certainly one of the easier use cases we'll look at. Now when I talk to this risk about my clients of the username harvest one of the things they often say is, oh, we have account lockout. So, and they're not really understanding the nature of this threat. And so I always slow down then to make sure they understand the nature of this threat. Um, username harvesting, at least the forms I'm going to show you and demonstrate, account lockout has 0% um, effectiveness against them. Why? I'm only trying one password per user. So on every system I've tried in the wild, ones I can show you, which are the systems I own, client systems that are running SSH, anything recent, the only reason I say anything recent is because really old systems use, use older hashing algorithms and you can't time them. So ironically, by improving your security, that's one of the great ironies of these new timing attacks based on crypto. You've done the right thing. You're using hard crypto. Uh, you're using hard crypto, which I'll discuss in a bit to make the password cracker's job much harder. You can say bcrypt or something like that. You're following best practices, but, but because you are, you opened up a new vector. Now, ironically, if your, your server is eight years old, it may not be vulnerable to this attack. Now, of course, you have many other problems. <laughs> I'm not saying run old software. I'm just saying that, ironically, sometimes the older systems aren't vulnerable to this because they're using much weaker crypto, which in this case is a plus. But, of course, the minus side of the equation is much, much higher in that case. 
So when I tell my clients, hey, I can guess usernames on your SSH um, daemon listening on the internet, they say, oh, we have account lockup, which is actually pretty unusual for SSH, but let's say they do. And I'll say, you're not understanding the nature of this threat. For username harvesting, at least the, the, the two methods I'll demo today, account lockup has no effect. I'm trying one password per account. Uh, and then they'll, they'll think about it for a bit. They'll say, okay, but inevitably that will lead to a username guessing, uh, well, a password guessing attack with a valid username, and our account lockup mitigates that. It's like, well, maybe yes, maybe no. And one of the, the flaws I see people falling for uh, as a defender, as a blue teamer, is you're assuming the attacker will comply with your defensive wishes. Of course, the attacker will do exactly the opposite. A smart one will anyways. So you build these defenses, such as account lockout, assuming uh, the attacker say me, I'm going to try uh, thousands of more passwords on one account. And certainly any type of typical Active Directory account lockout or pluggable authentication modules via SSH will mitigate that. Certainly it's not hard to time that, so uh, you can slow me down orders of magnitude. However, I'm not going to attack that way. I'm not going to try thousands of passwords one account. I'm going to try thousands of accounts one password. And every client I've talked to was completely blindsided by that suggestion. And in other words, instead of if I have a thousand usernames, a thousand passwords, I'm not going to try a thousand passwords one user. I'm going to try a thousand users one password, and then I'll cycle back and try the second thousand users one password. Then I'll then I'll loop back and try the third password thousand users. And often I don't have to do anything with the timing. The timing just magically works. I never trigger account lockout. If it's like three strikes in five minutes, you lock out a fairly typical Active Directory. Even use just five strikeouts five minutes because three is too low. The thing with account lockout, again, you're raising the total cost of ownership. People will fat finger their passwords all day long. They'll pick up the phone and call the help desk. So often, even in an active directory environment, when they're following best practices, you know, ish, um, you know, five wrong logins, five minutes. I can eat, if I have 100 or 1,000 accounts, by trying one password per, say, 1,000, I can have the script go as fast as it naturally would, and I won't trigger account lockout. And if I do, I can simply slow down a bit. You know, I can time it so, you know, try one password on a thousand accounts, 15 minutes later try a second, 15 minutes later try a third. Um, in the wild, I don't need to do it. I don't need to slow my script down at all. I just need to change the logic from one user, a thousand accounts to one account, a uh, thousand users. That's called password spraying. So um, account lockout's good. If you have internet facing systems, well, um, dual factor authentication, please. If you have anything sensitive internet facing, dual factor authentication, um, however, you know, easier said than done. Believe me, been there, done that, and lost the argument. I've, I've been in your shoes. Believe me. Um, make sure your account lockout you you factor for that, and make sure your systems don't signal the two different use cases of good user, bad password, bad user, bad password. <coughs> so, uh, again, I'm not saying account lockout is bad. I am saying knowledge is power, and make sure you defend accordingly. When I talk to people, and maybe this, is, this isn't the SANS crowd, maybe this is you know, your average IT crowd, they're fairly shocked at the, the, the magic of the password spraying uh, approach because in their minds they assume it's going to go thousands of passwords one user. So you have a client who's doing everything right, and they're uh, the same error, good username, bad password, bad username, bad password. And, but they've made the mistake of a single factor authentication on, a, on an internet facing system. Okay, now enter side channel attacks. Now, um, side channel attacks sound kind of theoretical. I've read about these for decades. And side channel attacks date to the 1940s, I believe, when a researcher at Bell Labs, when they were building the successor to American Sigma, a little uh, geek uh, trivia history here, crypto history, they were building the successor to the, uh, the US rotor machine which was a competitor to say uh, uh, Germany's much more famous Enigma. When they were building it, the, the successor in the late 1940s, a researcher, engineer realized every time the device encrypted something, an oscilloscope down the bench would jump. And every time the CPU labored, the oscilloscope would jump at perfect synchronization. And they discovered emanations then, and, and the whole Tempest came out of that, Tempest project, and uh, you know Faraday cages, and they realized that you could read, you could attack, an assist, attack a system based on physical attributes. These are called side channel attacks. And I love Bruce Schneier. Bruce Schneier is, you know, the, uh, the godfather of at least modern crypto. I won't say crypto. That would be Thomas Jefferson in the U.S. anyways. But, um, and Claude Shannon in the, in the, in the 50s. But 
of, of modern crypto, the, the author of Applied Cryptography, Bruce Schneier, weighs in. And I love this discussion on cheating because I, I have a lot of talk to my clients about physical attacks, uh, side channel attacks, and they'll often say, yeah, that's cheating. But words to that effect, that's illegal. Like, I'll, I'll break into your building or sneak into your building, I'll social engineer the secretary to say I forgot my umbrella and uh, drop off a pen testing box like the one that Bo Bullock was talking about at Black Hills Infos. And um, my client said, yeah, you're cheating. Well, guess what? <laughs> There's no conduct here for the black hat, certainly. Now, as a, as a pen tester, I do have a code of contact. I've got a scope. I've got rules of engagement. I've got laws, U.S. laws in my case, uh, in the U.S. And I've got morals. I've got ethics. I've got time. So I'm limited by a lot of factors. Um, so my, I, do, I personally do have rules of conduct. Of course, the black hats don't. The black hats do whatever they want. And so the idea of the no fairsies you cheated uh, as a reasonable um, argument against these attacks, you know, yes, yes, that would work, but that's not fair. That's not going to get you far. And uh, you know, Bruce Schneier is crazy quotable. Uh, read up on some of the stuff he's talking about, 9-11, security theater, all that stuff. He's a very, very quotable guy and stone cold genius. The guy wrote Applied Cryptography. You know, I read that book and couldn't understand parts, and, and he wrote that book. So <laughs> give you an idea of the orders of magnitude, how much smarter he is than I am. But um, he knows these problems very well, and uh, I just love that quote about prudent engineers adapt to this. They anticipate cheating, and they adapt. And I recommend the defenders in the room do the exact same thing. So, okay, so timing attacks, well, side channel attacks sound theoretical. CPU heat, you know, um, electromagnetic interference, you know, to read a CPU and therefore know that it's working hard and use that to break the crypto, which is all true, but, you know, my comp sci understanding of math and crypto, I, I, you know, uh, it take me a long time to actually understand the blow by blow of that. I, I certainly couldn't teach anyone that because I don't frankly understand all of that. But broad strokes, I get the idea. So, is this practical? Like, where does the rubber meet the road, which is where all pen testers live, of course, and that's one of the reasons I'm so drawn to pen testing. Where does the rubber meet the road? That sounds fine. It's like when Philip Oshlin wrote the first um, rainbow table. You know, uh, time memory trade-off. Sounds interesting. Sounds great. Not very practical. Phil Oshlin's like, yeah, let's do a rainbow table and represent, you know, uh, terabytes of data and megabytes of disk. Wow. Cool. You know, um, let's make this practical. That's where pen testers live. Uh, why well, I'm so drawn to this this field of, you know, I, I've spent my career in the trenches and I've seen people kind of uh, wave their hands to make very, very important things kind of drift away and not happen. You know, everyone argues that, everyone will agree that security is important, but somehow, hey, hey, there's important projects here, and hey, maybe later, or maybe later, and tomorrow never comes. And I've seen people build whole careers that are delaying and stopping change, important change. And there's a certain black and white truth to, I owned you. You know, I stole your data, uh, you know, and, and it's hard to make that go away. That's why I was so drawn to this because I was so frustrated by people. You know, working, I was working in healthcare years ago, eight years ago. We had medical data on Windows NT. I'm like, hey, they, they, they foolishly made me their HIPAA security officer, which gave me another, um, uh, you know, uh, a fist to punch with in a <laughs> metaphorical way. And uh, as soon as they made HIPAA security officer, I started bringing down the compliance side of the house, of course. And people arguing, you know, hey, you know, Windows NT is it a problem? Where does HIPAA say the words Windows NT? I had one CIO say to me, what does what does HIPAA say Windows NT? What does the U.S. government say? You cannot, thou shalt not run Windows NT. And of course, uh, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act, it's not that specific. And I'd say things like, well, it's not that specific. You know, it's it's high level. It's best practices. Next, and nothing happens. And a year later, there's Windows NT. This is in like 2007 when NT was, you know worse than XP is now, which is bad. And then I, I, I stole all this data, right? Oh, <laughs> conversation changes. So I, this is why I'm drawn to this. So side channel attack sounds good, but what does that mean to me? Like, can I do this on my next pen test? Yes. So here's the, here's the form I'm talking about here. You've got a good username, bad password, bad username, bad password, exact same error in both cases. Burp comparer is identical in both cases. Uh, no discernible difference, but what if the developer actually improved security, ironically, and decided to use a, a costly hashing algorithm, you know, and also use this efficient, their, their best, the following best practices and they're efficient. You know, why would I hash uh, uh, whatever the password claimed by a bad username, right? This makes, if, you're, if you've done any programming, if I have a good username, I'll hash the password, compare the results. If I have a bad username, 
No, why, why would I waste those cycles? And when I tell programmers the solution to this problem is to hash in both cases, hairs raise up on their back. Like it, it's, it just irks them, it, it just, they, they get rankled by the idea that they would waste these the CPU cycles to hash a password for a bad username. Like I have to sit at the table and say, pound and say, listen, like metaphorically again, <laughs> listen, hash the bad usernames. Like, why? It's a waste of time. Yeah, it's a waste of time. Exactly. You need to waste the time. Because if you don't waste the time, there's an opportunity here. Um, and the opportunity is more recent. So if you think about it, you back up a little bit. We have two use cases for hashing, although most implementers have ignored this, this idea. You have hashing for integrity and hashing for passwords. Both should be cryptographically strong, meaning hard to break, but hashing for integrity should be computationally weak, meaning fast, and hashing for passwords should be computationally expensive, meaning slow. So we really have two use cases where up until very, very recently, we use things like MD5 for both. Let's use MD5 for both, let's use SHA-1 for both, and let's use, you know, or, or base something on DES, base something on AES, base something on Blowfish, because it's interesting, Blowfish reared its head. Blowfish related to Two Fish, Bruce Schneier once again, uh, Two Fish was a competitor to AES. Uh, AES, well, Rindall won, AES became, Rindall became AES, but one of the requirements for AES, uh, they had a big kind of bake-off, NIST had those big, big bake-off, and um, came down to five finalists, but it was a, um, you, don't, you don't develop uh, ciphers via committee, no ciphers via committee. Because if you develop a cryptographic algorithm via committee, you get IPsec, and that's IPsec is awful. It's just too complicated. You know, you have two site encryption functions doing overlapping but different things. It's a classic work of committee. So AES was an international competition, as was SHA-3. It's the right way to do it. And Bruce Schneier, who lost a, the AES competition, still says that's the way to do it. But the best team win, here's requirements, and one of the requirements for AES was fast in hardware, fast in software, meaning don't use this for hashing. Right? Well, hashing. Well, don't use this for hashing passwords. And so, uh, Blowfish, which which is what OpenSSH is going to use for an unknown user, offers that opportunity because it's too fast. So historically, the hashes we've used MD5, SHA1, SHA2, they're designed to be resistant to quote collisions or two inputs creating the same hash. However, they're also designed to be very fast in hardware, which is what you use, what you want until you're hashing a password. So why do we want a slow algorithm for hashing a password? Because aren't we punishing our users every time they log in? Yeah, if you use bcrypt, you can actually feel the time. Uh, I'll show you on a form that's doing this, and it, it's slow enough that you can sense that time. It's not like, you know, uh, hundreds of milliseconds. It's like, or hundreds of seconds even. It's like seconds or a significant portion of a second that you can see the form waiting there for a clock tick or two. And so why am I doing that to my users? Why am I making them wait a second to log in? Aren't, aren't I punishing them that one second? Uh, yeah, uh, you are, but you're punishing the password cracker much, much more. If I'm cracking billions of passwords and you're slowing me down that much, you're making password cracking of bcrypt impractical even today using the most pa aggressive password cracking rig you have, um, you can build today. And so a recent comparison, I'm seeing some questions roll by, I will answer those at the end. Uh, if I can crack um, 180 billion password hashes per second, which you know a good high-end rig with a bunch of GPUs can do, I can do 71,000 bcrypt. In other words, uh, MD5 is 2.5 million faster to, uh, faster to crack than bcrypt. For every one bcrypt cra uh, hash, I can crack 2.5 million MD5 hashes. So MD5 cracks like a dream, and unsalted MD5 is a dream to crack, bcrypt is not. And hilariously, I remember the, uh, the Ashley Madison hack, the famous, famous Ashley Madison hack. Um, you know, that site where you can cheat on your spouse. That's like all dudes and bots in there basically. <laughs> and uh, professionals, I guess. And uh, mostly that. And um, when the news first came out, the initial passwords that were dumped were bcrypt encrypted, bcrypt hash. I'm like, I can't believe some implementer, some admin, some engineer developer at Ashley Madison new enough to use B, what an amazing, I, I, I couldn't believe, I remember the Ashley Madison stuff hit, my wife's like, what's this Ashley Madison stuff? I'm like, honey, it was just research. I promise you, I'm a research, I research, <laughs> kidding. And uh, <laughs> I had a reminder, I was kidding, she started getting upset, I was kidding. But, um, and later on, of course, what happened? Uh, I, I think they kept a copy of MD5 
as some backwards compatible thing to some other thing. The MD5 hatch is leaked and it was, it was a field day and it, all the password crackers were happy. So yes, you're punishing your users by using bcrypt. You're punishing the password crackers much, much more. And bcrypt, uh, some of the other ones I mentioned here, not practical to crack in real time unless you, you know, I think the Ashley Madison ones, they got like six character lowercase and it took them a week. Like it's just not practical. If you have any reasonably uh, secure password, complex password that you haven't reused someplace else, that's not in RAM, let's say, stolen via Mimikatz, it's all the attacker has is that hash. And that hash is a bcrypt hash. The attacker's not getting anywhere, uh, nowhere soon. And that's by spending thousands of dollars on, um, on hardware. So uh, this gives us an option. We can time it. We can time it in Burp for a web form, as I'll show you. We can time it in Zap. And we can just track the round trip time of the request of guessing a whole bunch of usernames um, with any password. And uh, one of the techniques I picked up in the wild is using the US Census top 100 last names, top 1,000 last names. I've used this to great success. Now you can certainly, you know, how do I know a valid username? There's all kinds of ways to do it. It was on the slide earlier. You know, public records research, Google, you know, LinkedIn, of course, public records. There's all kinds of ways to harvest uh, names and email addresses. You know, if I'm econrad at gmail.com, which is another address I have, is my SSH login econrad? Well, yes, it is. Not always. So by harvesting email accounts, people's names, if I know you work with John Smith and John Smith's email is jsmith, well, guess what, Rick Jones? You're R. Jones, probably. So we can do the classic kind of inference that pen testers have been performing for years, uh, or we can just automate this. And the way I've learned, what, one, one uh, trick I picked up along the way, uh, again, hacking in the US, US Census, top 100 name, last names, top 1,000 names. Now, when I say last name, I mean surname to my British, and friend, British friends and members of the Commonwealth, et cetera. So surnames, last names, I'll say last names out of habit. Um, and of course, if you're in the UK or Australia, wherever, you would use a different source of names, perhaps. But the US Census has detailed last name, inf last name information from the year 2000. Unfortunately, the most recent, at least public first name information, which I want for the uh, initials, is from 1990. Kind of old, like Mary is the number one name in 1990. Now, that's not the number one name of people owning SSH accounts. Uh, so it's not perfect. However, it, it allows me to get 100 or 1,000 or you know, much, many more. I think 151,000 last names they released in order of popularity. And a list of common initials, J, M, et cetera. And if it only takes me three seconds per guest uh, on a demon, which is what it takes roughly, I can actually guess um, the top 100 uh, last names, all initials in uh, under a day, actually an hour and a half. Uh, the top 1,000 last names, all initials under a day. And you can actually just try every common name, every initial, uh, go into the thousands easily in a day. And, this, and once you start doing this, you start finding all, assuming there's a lot of accounts there. Now, this is predicated on the fact that you're going to have people with fairly common names. But uh, as my, my test data, I use SANS instructors, E. Conrad, S. Meisner, uh, less common, uh, David Miller, D. Miller, easy to guess, right? Uh, Sarah Edwards, you know, so um, I, I use Robert Lee, you know. I, I created some test accounts for my, my, my SANS instructor friends just to see what this would look like against kind of live-ish, you know, pseudo, you know, live data. It's still test data, but try to simulate reality when I, when I you know, I, I don't have a server I own with a thousand accounts on it. My clients do, but I can't show you that, right? So that's what we did. And as a very, very happy coincidence, I'd already pitched this talk. I already wrote the, the abstract and all that stuff uh, over a month ago. And then in mid-July, Eddie Harari dropped this bomb of uh, a practical timing attack versus open SSH. And it happened to be, per I didn't even need to change my abstract. It just kind of fit. Now, I'm stretching out from web app pen testing to pen testing, but hey, uh, there's no way I'm not talking about this because this is too awesome for you not to be using this. If you're a pen tester or a defender, uh, you need to be using this. You need to test this. It is crazy practical. And, and it, the interesting thing here is it, um, it's doing the right thing, sort of. Same error, good username, bad password, bad username, bad password. It's encrypting in both cases, so they figure this out. However, it's using Blowfish to encrypt a bad username's password. It's using the system chosen hash algorithm to encrypt a good uh, username with a bad password. And this opens the door to a very, very practical attack. I've done literally everything I tried. 
Everything I tried simply worked. And uh, the opportunity is here is used to be doll sign two was the state of the art Linux and uh, password hash encryption, say back ten years ago. If you have like an old Red Hat system from back in the day, back when Red Hat ruled the uh, the world, at least in the open source versions, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was two or something like that, and it used Blowfish, which was fast. So if your your system shadow file says use Blowfish, that's the first field of the, of the password. So the password in the shadow file is algorithm you know colon salt colon hash. Algorithms uh, doll sign two or two in that case actually doll sign two. Yep. Um, that says use Blowfish. However, Ubuntu 12.04, 14.04, and 16.04 use dollar sign six, which is SHA 5.12. SHA 5.12 is about eight times slower, and eight times slower is uh, all we. That's way more than we need. Twice as slow probably would have done it. Eight times slower is just icing on the cake. It's easy. So um, I haven't. Uh, I've actually the system I'm going to demonstrate to you. I actually patched it a week ago, not knowing I'd be doing this. Um, but I haven't rebooted the system yet. So this is a, a system that's been patched but not rebooted, and I don't want to reboot it, and I hope it doesn't crash because <laughs> I'm going to demo this attack on a live system on the Internet, and then when the talk's done, I'll, uh, I'll reboot and see if that solved the problem. So the opportunity is, again, it, it's interesting. that They're following the best practice. They've clearly anticipated the use case of good using and bad password, bad using and bad password, but they used a binary configured algorithm inside the binary and they use the system chosen algorithm for a real username. And if those two differ, as on any modern Linux, et cetera, system they do, Unix, any SSH system, uh, there's the opportunity. So here's Eddie Harari's uh, sample code. It assumes port 21, by the way. You can just do a port, you know, comma port equals under the try here. So it says try. Uh, you can do comma port equals if you, like me, run your SSH daemons on different ports, at least on the internet and uh, internet facing stuff. So here's a sample code. It easily works. If you want to drop that into Kali, it works uh, out of the box. It uses Paramico, which is a fantastic Python library for SSH. It makes SSH connections trivial to set up. Uh, wonderful for this kind of work. And if you don't want to deal with dependencies and whatnot of installing uh, these libraries, um, just go ahead and use Kali. You just drop the script right in there. Link is on my website or at conrad.com. It'll work out of the box. You just have to change the 127001 to be um, whatever you want. And again, full shout out to Eddie Harari and uh, the script I wrote. Uh, you know, was uh, the vast majority of the effort, and credit goes to Eddie Harari. So um, I put up a GitHub site, and it's called Enumerate, which is in the uh, the half an hour. Or so I thought about naming this. Uh, my rule on names for tools is they're easy to type, and there's no major tool that, that I found in our world that uses that name. I was going to call it Time Lord. Um, that was taken. <laughs> I was going to call it Time Bandit, and that was taken um, by a recent Black Hat DEF CON ShmooCon talk. And so as far as I know, enumerate with a number eight. If not, I'm sorry. I did a half an hour research, and uh, my apologies if someone else has taken that name. And uh, it just wraps Eddie's uh, script, cleans it up a little bit, makes a few changes, and the, the, the feature I added is to make it beyond POC, use it at work, feed it a list of names, either accounts, either full accounts or last names, and it'll do either. It'll, it'll either just try the names you provided as account names, or if you choose to guess the first initial, it'll uh, guess the most common first initials, it'll prepend the most common first initials there. So in another tool I wrote, wondering what are the most common first initials? And I'm, again, I'm kind of the rubber meets the road kind of person. And I figured X and Q and Z were uncommon, but I didn't really know other than what I kind of thought of. And I thought, okay, let's pull down U.S. Census data and crank through that and, and actually calculate the most common names. Uh, first of all, first initials. And then maybe I can use that to inform my attack. So on the right-hand side here are the most common first initials in 1990 in the U.S. Uh, again, a bit dated, but, you know, um, close enough, certainly for this approach. And you're looking at percentage of males and females with this first initial. J is very common, M, R, D, C. Um, and down the bottom, you get uh, X, Xavier. You know, if, if you want your, um, your child to be safe from these types of password guessing attacks, name them Xavier, Quincy, Zeke, or Uma, and perhaps um, I won't find them, right? <laughs> so uh, to make it a little more efficient, because I do like to be efficient, uh, by default, Enumerate uses the top 22 initials. Basically, it drops off to things below um, or around or below one-tenth of one percent. 
So one one hundredth of one percent of U.S. people in 1990 had Xav or X as the first name initial, and then UUX are the least common. It's funny googling around. There was one site that said it was I IZQX, which sounded good to me, but then looking at it. Um, Iris, Irene, you know, Ignatius. It's, I is more common, maybe because people are thinking of male names. I don't know. Um, but the order was a little different than I thought. So certainly if you want to go drop between I and below, you can tune this. Um, you want to be super efficient, top 100 names, top five initials. I, I, that'd be, you know, 500 guesses. That'd be really, really efficient going in. This is going in blind on names where you don't have any inference on who might be there. And um, using the top 22 I, I tried the top 100 U.S. names against uh, SANS instructors, a few other folks, just to get a, 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 a sample size of people I didn't mind talking about because you can just go to the certified SANS instructor list and see our names, you know, Rob Lee, Seth Meister, John Strand, Mark Baggett. And um, so I, I didn't feel embarrassed by listing these people's names. There's data I can share with you, and I could do a real-world test. So I ran enumerate-ssh.py uh, and uh, across a network, now a local network, I will demonstrate via the Internet next. Uh, 2,200 connections in 1.5 hours, meaning you could easily guess top 1,000 names, top 10,000 names. Uh, this is very practical, all initials. And if you want to go from 22 to 26, you're not really spending that, not, that much more time. Again, um, very practical. It works, and it works against every single system I tried. My systems, client systems, I'll share, you my, I'll share my data with you. It works on everything. And again, I'm surprised it hasn't made a bigger wave than it has, and I'm hoping to uh, change that. So um, here's a list of folks it found. Now, if you know SANS instructors, you probably know um, um, Josh Wright, Norris Campbell, Mike Perez, uh, Minoc, uh, Robert Lee, David Miller, Alyssa Torres, Jake Williams, Mason Brown, Eric Johnson, Don Williams. These are real people. I created um, SSH, well, accounts for them on an Ubuntu 1404 blocks. I figured that was a good sweet spot to test. And uh, it didn't find me because I'm like 600 and something, a Conrad. It didn't find Seth Meisner because he's way lower than that. So Seth names his son Zeke or Xavier. I think yeah, Xavier will be uh, pretty safe from this. And um, very practical. So uh, uh, there's no test like production, right, folks? So let's test this. <coughs> we go wrong. All right. So I will first show you the lock using Kali. Excuse me. Actually, um, let's let's. Now I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's show you the actual. Let's let's do the burp and zap thing first, and then I'll save the uh, the Kali. <coughs> the end. All right. So let's do the bcrypt thing first. Sorry, I was getting excited. I was thinking about open SSH, and I, I didn't want to break off twice for demos. Because breaking off once is dangerous enough. So what I've got now is I've got a login form, and I'm going via uh, burp pro here. And this is the easy case. This is the easy use case where we're going to prove <coughs> the concept. So I'll type, you know, this and this, and nothing comes back. And then I'll type eConrad, and I'll type any path. I'm just typing like ASDF here. You'll see very shortly what I typed. And notice, this is the easy case. We're going to build off this for the timing attack. And on the easy case, eConrad still filled in. So this is going to be a piece of cake to fuzz. So we'll go to burp. I do recommend Burp Pro or Zap. If I have time, I look okay on time, I'll do a quick demo of Zap. If you haven't used Zap since Zap 2.4, the buzzer, uh, the, the buzzer, yeah, the Burp fuzzer is called the buzzer. That's what all the kids call it today. No, the, um, the Zap fuzzer, or Zuzzer as the kids call it, uh, the Zap fuzzer has been vastly improved since version 2.4, as of version 2.4. If you tried Zap like a year or two ago and thought, okay, well, a little more, that's nice, but, you know, Burp for power work, I love Burp, don't get me wrong. Um, check out uh, I almost said Zerp, <laughs> or Zap and Burp, as the kids call it today. Sorry, and um, it's funny. I've been sitting in my office all morning. I clearly have uh, not worked out the uh, my English issues here. I haven't spoken to anyone because I'm a nerd. All right, so we're gonna go through and fuzz this form using, in this case, Burp, and um, so this is the uh, we got a post here. We got a post here. Uh, let's do another one here. I'm going through uh, eConrad and uh, Burp Pro. Log in there. And uh, let me just change my windows a bit. Yeah. So, all right, here's a, here's a sample login. I'm going to fuzz this using a, a cluster bomb. So I'm going to send to Intruder. This is Burp's. This is the uh, Burp Suite, of course, the famous Burp Suite. 
Uh, burp community is a great way to test it. However, burp community for this is going to be a bit limited because of the, the fuzzer slows down in community. Uh, on the professional version, it is unlimited. I'm running pro right now. Uh, the fuzzer's already pre-selected some fields. However, I only want this field, in fact, two parts of this field. I'm going to choose a cluster bomb, which is I'll describe shortly. But I'm going to fuzz the first initial. I'm going to add that. I'm going to fuzz the last name. I'm going to add that. Biggest issue here is cutting and pasting properly because we are copying properly because we're we're cutting up one field into two. And during my testing, I would often mess that part up. Now I've got payloads. I want A, a through Z for the E and the U.S. Census top 100 names for the Conrad. I go to payloads and simple list. I'll do A through Z. That's the first initial. Payload set one is the first field in order of the HTML, uh, meaning the the initial, meaning uh, this guy here. And now for the, the second field, I'm going to choose the U.S. Census top 100 names from the year 2000. And maybe maybe wondering, why not 2010? The U.S. Census kind of delays the release of this data over time. They released the, the complete data, like they just released 1940, meaning all the data. And they released less of it for the more recent data. The most recent last name information we have, from, publicly anyways, is 1990. Uh, sorry, 2000 for the last names. Runtime file. I'll select my file. And I'm going to choose the U.S. Census Top 100. I included this in Enumerate. If you go to the, the GitHub site, again, if you go to ericconrad.com, you'll see that link. This, 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 these files are there in the word list directory. So I got the U.S. Census Top 100 fuzzing A through Z on E, the U.S. Census Top 100 on Conrad. Let's go. In this case, um, it gives 200 for everything. However, the length should be different. Yeah. You notice Don Williams just popped in, Jake Williams just popped in, Eric John just popped in, David Miller. These are SANS instructors. So it's returning a 200 for everything, which is actually more common than I thought. Like before I did a lot of web app pen testing, I assumed 200 was a valid username and 404 was an invalid or something. A lot of forms return a 200 for everything. However, it's reflecting the name back. And you can certainly catch the reflection if you wanted to do this more programmatically. But you can just tell by the link down to, down to Rob Lee. It looks like invalid, it's always 1273 for an invalid user, and it's higher for a valid user. The test case here, the blank one, is eConrad, the one that I sent. That's why that one's longer, too. eConrad's also valid. It's not being guessed because Conrad is not a terribly common name. It's in the top 1,000, but not in the top 100, okay? So that's the easier form. Let's close that. Let's go to the harder use case, which is the secure login. Same form, same users, right? And in this case, bad username, bad password, nothing. Good username, bad password, watch the timing, tick. If you notice this, you can actually catch it once you see it. It pauses for a second. That's bcrypt. This is bcrypt, which is default for PHP 5.5, by the way. So the bad username, bad password is gone immediately. Good username, bad password, it's slow enough that you can actually see the clock tick. Watch it. Tick. It's there for a second. Certainly slow enough for Burp to notice. So I'm going to rerun the attack, um, this time using all responses will be the same length, but the timing will be different. Or should be different if I didn't mess something up. You never know. Live demos, right? So um, I'm going for the secure login form. There it is here. So the difference here is same users, same system, but I'm going for the secure login form. So let's fuzz that, send to intruder. Same exact thing I did before. I'm gonna I'm gonna clear out because it's it's you know it's it's pre-selecting some fields to fuzz, and um, I'm gonna go for a cluster bomb. Oh, I want to talk about that cluster bomb. Cluster bomb is all inputs, all combination of all inputs. So in other words, I'm gonna go A through Z here. That's 26. Top 100 uh, last names of the 2000 U.S. Census here, which is 100. And again, I've made mistakes in my, my practicing here, my testing. All right. And so cluster bomb will be tw do 26 times 100 or 2,600 guesses. Cluster bomb is all inputs, all combinations of inputs to, um, to fuzz. So 26 first initials, uh, 100 last names, surnames, as my British friends say, 2,600 combinations is what cluster bomb will do. That's what I want. The, uh, the first field is going to be A through Z. I just to be forced, same exact thing. The second field with the last name will be the runtime file of the uh, top 100 last names per US census. Just as before, same attack. 
Now, the response time is going to be the same for everything. Oh, yeah, um, by default, it doesn't show you the, uh, the time. The app does, by the way. So I just quickly went to show the response completed field. I'll show you, I think, the milliseconds maybe. Yeah, here we go. So um, it's not there by default. So the first time I tested this, I'm like, mm, where is it? And then uh, response completed. Again, columns, response completed. Burp community can do this. Burp community is free if you want to test this. However, um, it's, it's going to slow down the fuzzer. If you're guessing hundreds of names, you want to go Burp Pro or Zap can do it too. And here we have again, uh, Jake Williams, Don Williams, Mason Brown, Eric Johnson, Mike Perez, et cetera. So it, it successfully guessed all the names. Uh, N Williams, which doesn't exist, was 19 milliseconds. I, I'm assuming that's milliseconds. I don't know. Uh, e Conrad, which is a test case, everything that's real was 600, we'll say milliseconds. I'll assume that. Everything failed was 19. Very, very easy to um, tell. And just quickly, because I think I'm good on time, I'm going to um, risk the wrath of the demo gods and show you Zap. Same exact attack. Uh, why? Because um, I'm a glutton for punishment. All right. So this is the Security 542 VM, by the way. And um, it's got this little proxy selector, which is really handy. I know I can fish around and go to the settings, but it's really handy to do this kind of work. I've already got Zap loaded up. Again, this is Zap 2.5, latest and greatest as of yesterday anyways. And uh, you want to try this attack in Zap, it works really, really well. So I'll just quickly do the same thing. Again, I'll just do eConrad in the interest of time. Same form, same everything, different um, interception proxy. The reason I want to show you Zap is to, to demonstrate how improved Zap is if you haven't used it recently, including its fuzzer, which is real deal professional now. Um, I definitely use Burp Pro the most, but Zap is fantastic. So if I look at the request in Zap, eConrad pass, same thing as before. I'm gonna, in this case, it's attack and fuzz. So check out Zap 2.4 plus or 2.5 that's out today. It's gonna drop in here. I'm gonna fuzz on the E. I'm gonna add that. Now, gotcha here, pro tip, avoid my mistakes. To send an A through Z, you need a regex. The regex is A through Z with, with brackets around it. Now, if you leave this as a thousand, hit add, and we'll start the fuzzing eventually, Zap will consume all RAM and, and um, basically lay down and die very, very slowly and painfully. Uh, been there, done that the hard way. <laughs> um, it says experimental for a reason. Make this 26. So if you go A through Z with 1,000, it'll try to guess A through Z 1,000 times, and it basically does not compute, does not compute, and it blows up. Uh, make that 26. Uh, pro, uh, if you don't, Zap will crash, and it's like a kill dash nine situation. All right, in my experience. All right. And uh, last name, same last, oops, same before. I'm going to add that. Add, in this case, the file. I'm going to select my file. The, uh, this is a numerate word list. You can download a numerate. Just go to my website, ericconrad.com, top 100, add that, say OK. Should be good to go. It's fast. See here, it's going to 2,600 requests. It's halfway through now. It's real, real fast. And uh, maybe about as fast as, as Burp and maybe a little faster. I don't know. So let's go to the round trip time, which is there by default. And the round trip time is, uh, yeah, Mike Perez, Mason Brown, uh, Minoc, uh, Norris Campbell, David Miller, uh, Don Williams, et cetera. It got the same list of users. Um, the invalid users begin around, R. Smith isn't there. So um, it goes from uh, Alyssa's fake account is 500 milliseconds. It drops down to, uh, you know, pretty low here. I don't think I have an R. Smith. That time he's interesting. It is a little noisy that way. It's very dependent on network congestion and whatnot. And um, uh, oh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the question in the end. I see some questions rolling by. This Zap software is 100% free from OWASP, by the way. And um, a little fuzzy. I don't think it's an R. Smith, but it's still an outlier. If you run it two or three times, you'll get it. All right, let's see. I'm 12 minutes of, so I'm um, good on time. Let's um, show you the open SSH attack. All right, so my, th my fourth demo. I'm really tempting fate here. This is Kali Unix, Linux rather. And uh, yeah, so I'll full screen him. So here's a live, this is a live attack uh, using uh, these names. J. Snow, D. Targaryen, E. Conrad, and Lannister. And your keen powers of inference might tell you which one could be correct. 
Um, <laughs> so I've already got a locally hacked, um, I've already changed the uh, script to uh, account for the new site. This is a live attack on the OpenSSHD flaw. I'm only doing four, and I'm not guessing any first initials because I don't want to sit here for 10 minutes watching a script run. So I'm just I'm going to feed these four names. I've already configured enumerates to do so, and it's going to try to SSH in as these four users. And let's go. So Jay Snow would be hilarious if this worked. That'd be great. Shock reveal, because um, you know, an IP tables firewall is no match for Valerian Steel. Like I think everyone knows that. And notice E Conrad. It's sitting, sitting. Sitting. This is a 1604 system. Uh, but it's still waiting. Like, get a cup of coffee, come back. Like, this is real data. It's, it's trying 20, a 20,000 character password. Still waiting. Still waiting. Like, it's 20 seconds. Okay, these are seconds. So, fake accounts are 2 point something seconds. This is via the internet. A real account is 20 seconds. And uh, your keen powers of inference were probably correct and that eConrad was the only valid account. Again, this is a real system. This is a system I thought was very secure. Uh, it's a system I can show you, unlike my client systems. All my client systems, same exact story, by the way. I'm, I'm hardly telling all my clients to uh, <laughs> mitigate this flaw. And um, of those four users, you exist, and it's plain as a nose in your face that they're there. See the live data? Yesterday, I tried uh, 20, 22,000, 2,200 guesses. And uh, I'll just, um, here's the out file here. This is the out file from 2,200 guesses, meaning 100 common last names and uh, 20 most common first initials. Here's the live data. We don't have any Smith, so my inference on Smith was correct. I don't know. Oh, we have an Eric Johnson. He jumps out, right? And we've got a Jake Williams and a Don Williams, right? And it's fine, reliably. We've got a Mason Brown and Brown. And I don't know if we have any Joneses. We do have a Miller and et cetera. So again, super real data, kind of fake real data. If you sort them, I simply do a sort, which is a saying is sort by number on the set field, meaning this field. Bang. The uh, Sarah Edwards is legit, T Myers is not. Most are three seconds-ish or less. A few go a little bit longer, like T Myers is interesting, but again, it's, it's a live network, live internet, congestion uh, factors in here, etc. So that was 2,200 guesses in 1.5 hours. Uh, no parallelization, by the way, not, not in parallel. The next feature request I'm going to add to enumerate is threading. I'm going to add threads. You could do easily 10 in parallel. I don't think you'd overwhelm an SSH server doing 10 threads in parallel. And then you could, you could have blown through 1,000 names in the same amount of time here, uh, meaning 10,000 names in a day, uh, all initials or all, all common initials or all initials if you want. Super, super practical. Um, that's called enumerate, and I'll come back to, uh, I'll just show you here. That's a live demo, and again, th this was real data from yesterday. I ran this. I promise you, non-doctored data. Those were all valid accounts that are in the, um, they're in Etsy Shadow. It didn't find me or Seth because our, our our names are less common. Like if you're in dash n Conrad word list, I have the U.S. Census top 151,000, and uh, Conrad 786. So I'm I'm in the top thousand, but not the top hundred, and I think Seth is even lower. I'll pick on Seth. My Zenar. These files are in um, enumerate. Uh, oh, he he's way down there. He's 116,000. So yeah, young Xavier Zenar, I think would be pretty safe. Um, all right. So let me show you. Just a reminder, as we're doing work pretty well. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, oh, let me close this window here. Uh, just one more thing, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. I'll take questions. And if I don't, have, if I run out of time for a question because I was I was maximum demo time, uh, feel free to email me. So just um, to wrap that up. Any questions? I'm going to go to questions next. Uh, just email me, Eric. Uh, 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 go to my website, ericconrad.com. The talks there, all links are there. A link to enumerate is there. If you like this style of uh, you know lab and teaching and uh, coins and whatnot, check out 542. Seth and I are now co-authors, and we have an auto capture the flag based on uh, the timing attack is straight from 542, et cetera, uh, decrypt, all that good stuff. Check out ericconrad.com, and now I will take a look at questions. So let's see. Uh, fa fail to ban would eliminate, eliminate password spraying. No, 
but if I, it looks the wrong IP within a specified period of time. Dallas, I'm not familiar with fail to ban, so I'll give that shout out to everyone else. Check out fail to ban. Uh, I trust Dallas on this one. Uh, he's telling me eliminate password, uh, at least uh, mitigate password spraying. Uh, our system also locks the account only unlocked by admin. 15 failed attempts between successful logins. That's Sean. Thank you, Sean. That's a good point. So just count the number of times without a timer. I like that control, Sean. That's good. So for the blue team is in the room, yeah, don't do it based on time. Do it based on amount. I like that. So solid control there. It wouldn't stop me from guessing the usernames, but I can only get 15 password guesses. That's good. I like that. Uh, where do I get the fuzz you showed in the demo? Uh, those lists by Blessin are on, uh, they're in Enumerate. So go to my website, ericconrad.com, and there's a link to Enumerate, which is on GitHub. And the software used and the word list used and all that are there. And I guess I get the same two questions from Blessin. I think that's all the questions I got, and for time, it's right on the hour. I, um, well, it looks like five minutes of. So I'll hang around for a while, folks. Uh, thank you to see you in Security 542 or elsewhere and um, try this one out at home, at work. It works really well. Thank you. All right. I was just giving it a minute to see if any more questions came in, but it doesn't look like it. So thank you so much, Eric, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.